Hi there, Bob here with JD Squared. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, it's December 31st, Saturday afternoon, and I'm in the factory by myself so that I could shoot this video. So I would like to wish everybody a happy New Year's at JD Squared. I'm ex super excited about 2023. There's gonna be a lot of changes going on, and I will detail all of those in this video. Also, a tremendous amount has happened in the last uh, six weeks or so in regards to the XR12. And I'm going to blame that on Steve from Kentucky, David, Dean, John, <clears throat> all these people that have got XR12s on order who have been feeding me ideas of things that we could do with this machine to make sure it's one of the world's premier machines. Anyway, um, no more suggestions, guys. I'm out of I'm out of room, as you'll see here in a little while what I show you. But I think what I'm going to tell you should, should blow your mind. It's an absolute game changer in the industry of what we're trying to accomplish here at JD Squared. So <clears throat> without further ado, let's start talking about it. I've gone ahead and repositioned the camera so you could better see what I've loaded up into the machine. And it is basically the max inertia capacity of the XR12. And it's a piece of 12 inch by 12 inch square tube, half inch wall, 24 feet long, weighs just south of 2,000 pounds. It is a hunk of metal and yet the, the XR12 handles it like it's nothing, no problem at all. Um, now that is the standard um, size of material that the XR12 and the XR6 is designed for, in other words, 24 feet long right out of the box. That doesn't mean that the machine is limited to 12 inch. So for instance, we can cut 18 inch pipe in this machine, we just can't cut it 24 feet long. It's an inertia issue. So the greater the inertia, um, the harder it is to spin accurately. Therefore, we're limited to the inertia of a 12 inch schedule 80 pipe, 24 feet long. Um, and we have a, quite a bit of headroom above that, but we don't like to get into that. We want our machines to be 24-7, 365 reliable, which means don't push the motors or the machines beyond a certain point. And at JD squared, that point is 80% capacity. That's what we shoot for. Anyway, so that's what we've got loaded in the machine. <clears throat> if you notice, I do not have the drill head on the machine as I did in the previous version, even though the drilling attachment should be coming out here at the end of January. We're still trying to um, work back through the software to add the drilling routines. I'll talk about that here in a second. And then once we do that, we'll bring it out. But after Fabtech in mid-November, um, we are going to have to make a couple changes to the drill head. It's minor stuff, easy peasy, um, something that I learned. And I'll talk about that when I specifically in this video start talking about what we're doing on the tooling plate side of the machine. Alrighty, um, notice there's no covers on the machine right here. That's on purpose. I want to walk around with the camera and show you what we're doing. We have made substantial changes to not the structure of the machine. That's ironclad solid. Everything's working great. We've added capabilities to the machine for future growth. In the meantime, let me do this. Let me walk around a little bit with the camera, show you what we're doing in production right here. Then we'll get back and one thing at a time, the power head, the new electronics, everything like that. We'll start talking to, to you. Uh, I'll start explaining to you why we did that and why we did it now. All right, let me go ahead and grab the camera. Okay, let's start heading over to production. Notice what I've done here. Instead of putting in the extension on our test machine, um, we just went ahead and built this stand right here in order to um, extend it past the, uh, past the machine. And that is another thing that you could do. Now, another thing, if you notice, I've gone to a new ring design and I'll be showing you that here in just a couple of seconds of how they work. Anyway, over here, a lot of the machines have been shipped out. I think there was six of them here uh, not uh, just a few days ago or a week ago. A lot of customers have come and picked their flatbeds up. And I know we have an XR12 hiding way back out there waiting for the customer to come. I mean, an XR6 coming to get it. Anyway, these are the six XR12s that we kind of halted production on them um, right after Fabtech. And the reason we did that was a thing called beamline machines which some of our customers have basically talked me into trying to emulate. Um, <clears throat> but you can see where um, pretty, pretty substantial machines. So these are the six that are currently built, being built. Now, if you notice, 
None of them have control boxes on them. We have made all the control boxes. We had all of that stuff right here. Everything was made and we decided to scrap it. And that was a very, very expensive decision. Um, one that cost us well into five figures. But I think for the future of what we're trying to accomplish with these machines, it was well worth it. You could actually see a little bit more. In fact, let me walk over here and I'll show you some stuff um, on the XR12. <clears throat> That's the drive system right there with the motors. This is the um, carriage assembly with our, um, can't call it proprietary, but we're the, we're the ones that come up with it. A drive system right here that basically it's a extremely low backlash system, like almost zero pressure on the spur gear. Works really, really good. The XR12 has a very large uh, timing belly pulleys in it, runs a 10 inch chuck, things pretty heavy, all kinds of bearings in it. Um, big Yaskawa motor right there. I love that company, they're a great company. Here's a little bit better view of the power head. You can see the twin linear guides in it with the 16 millimeter trapezoidal screw, also powered by Yaskawa servo. On the front of it, we've got our belt tension belt system, and I will show you how that is done right here. You can see where the belt is spring loaded. Now this is not all attached because obviously more plates, more plates go up here, but um, essentially it's a spring loaded system that runs through rollers here to keep the dust off of the twin linear guides that are inside the machine. Notice we have a large ball screw in there and we run the scrapers on the ball screw also. And we did this, this is a very, this is a 12 inch piece of channel, it's very heavy. We did all that and it really has to do with drilling. Um, you need a lot of rigidity when you're drilling. So we've done that, of course, uh, you can't see it in this machine, I think it's on ours over there. The pneumatics go into there, so that right here so that when we drill, the entire gantry clamps itself down to stabilize the drill. Obviously, we have the whole chuck that'll slide in and out because when you load up real heavy material, like that square material over there, there is no uh, side shift in it easily after you do that. So anyway, this is pretty much um, where we're at here on production. Now, We've got new boxes being built. I'll show you the new boxes. There's more gantries getting ready to go on the next two machines right there. Um, those frames are back in pout, or way back there in powder. Um, so they'll be probably hitting the floor next week. We're, like I said, we're currently building uh, 16 machines. So let's walk over here. And um, there's flatbed tables um, getting ready to go right there. Oh, I love these guys. Just got another load of um, Yaskawa. Uh, take a look here. That's a beautiful, beautiful site right there, guys. That's Yaskawa servo motors and amplifiers. We absolutely love that company. Um, and, and I'll tell you why we love their motors here in a little while. But anyway, these are three, or I guess four flatbeds being built um, currently right here. All right, let's walk back over to the XR12 and talk about that because all of our flatbeds and everything and the XR6 is full production, everything's going great. XR12s was where the holdup came in. All right, let me walk back over to the XR12 and I will start showing you feature by feature what, what we're doing and why we did it. Okay, so here's what happened. In mid-November, we went to Fabtech in Atlanta for the big trade show. Now, before we went there, um, Steve from Kentucky, he's got the very first XR12 on order, um, was telling me about beamline machines. Now, what a beamline machine does, if you don't know, because I didn't know, is it basically is what handles all of the I-beams and a lot of structures are done on beamline machines. Now, these machines are giant, they're big, they're huge, and they are incredibly expensive, average around 800,000 to a million dollars. And what they are, is basically picture this cube, like an enclosure, and inside the enclosure, they have a robotic arm. Now, they have a shuttle system on it, so let's just say you load up a piece of 16-inch I-beam. Then what these machines will do is they'll, just like an automatic saw that you may see, the devices will grab the material, bring it in, X the number of feet, four or five feet, whatever the capacity the robotic arm is to do it, and it will start cutting away on that I-beam. Now, the beauty of those things is that they can 
you could basically load up your I-beam flat. You don't have to spin it because currently with the XR12, if we were going to cut, let's just say, a 12-inch I-beam on, on three sides, because that's typically all you really need to cut on, um, you're going to have to spin it, which means we have to put a ring on it. Uh, you know, and, that, and that's just more work, more, more time, it's time consuming. So a beamline machine is better at processing uh, I-beams and channel and everything like that than the XR12 when it comes to convenience because you don't have to put the ring on it. You bring it in with a forklift, you set it down and away you go. And we do that right now if we're working on channel and we're only doing one side of it. We may load the, the channel up, C-channel, to where the, the flanges are facing down and then we process the top. All right, so anyway, here I am. I'm at, I'm at Fabtech and I'm looking at these very, very expensive beamline machines. They got the robot, which the robotic arm, by the way, allows you, if, if I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to show you this. Let's just say this is the side of an I-beam. This is the web right here. The robotic arm allows you to come around cut the side, you know, come in, cut the inside, and then cut the other side. Really, really, really cool. Really, really expensive. Well, anyway, here I am. I show up at this thing, and I'm looking at it. you got to realize, sometimes I, 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 I'm crazy. You know, let's just put it that way. I look at that, and I thought, you know what? We can do that on the XR12. We can emulate a beamline machine. I give credit to Steve out of Kentucky. He's the first guy who... Um, brought this up to me. Um, however, that would mean we'd have to make substantial changes to the machine in order to accomplish that. So let me tell you what my thoughts are and what our target is for 2023. And it's basically is to build a mini beamline machine. And in some ways, depending on what you're doing, if you're doing smaller I-beam, the XR12 will be better than those mega dollar machines because the mega dollar machine you're feeding the tube or the the beams in from one end and it's coming out the other end of the machine which means you've got to have a capacity of a little more than double well maybe double the length of your workpiece because you know in out you know whereas on the xr12 everything is handled within the 28 feet or 30 feet or whatever of frame length of the machine, saving you a pretty good amount of room. Now, there are things that a beamline machine is going to beat me on. For instance, it'll handle 40 foot material, you know, whereas we are going to put the long machines on hold. And I'm sorry for the guys who want long machines, but uh, everybody, I think there's four of them, want us to build long machines. Um, we're we're, we're going to, we're going to, We'll, we'll play that by ear around the middle of the year, but right now our focus is totally on the XR12, just basically what 99% of the people want out there. All right, so anyway, in order for me to emulate a beamline machine, which means, in other words, we have to have the torch here to where the torch is now going to have to turn completely sideways this way and that way and tilt in and out. So here's the roadmap for the XR12. What we're going to do, I'm going to walk behind the machine, a little bit easier to show you. If we're cutting this kind of material here, no problem, right? We, we have plenty of clearance, we have plenty of room. But if we're going to try to turn the torch sideways so that we can cut up and down this way, you could see where the bottom of the tooling plate is not going to allow that to happen. So what we have to do is make another axis on the front of the plate that will go up and down independently of the tooling plate in front of the marking system and in front of the drill system and allow us to turn sideways. Now, our controller in the XR12 is a, a really good one. I mean, the controller in the machine has four gigabytes of memory on board, and that's to handle 3D processing like taper and all that stuff. That's what why we put such a powerful controller in it. Now, however, if we're gonna go ahead and do that, I'm hoping I'm, hoping I'm explaining this to you good. So not only will we have a Z axis here that will go up or down, and you see it right here. Um, I don't have my glasses on, you get it. Um, it'll go up or down. We have to slave another servo on it to drive that axis because they've gotta be coordinated with each other. That's not a problem with the new controller system that we're shipping on all of our machines because we can control 32 motors, nine of them coordinated with each other, nine synchronized axis. So that becomes a no-brainer. Now it's gonna be a really 
fun engineering challenge to design this because we're limited to the amount of room that we have. Now, yes, I could build bigger tooling plates. That's no problem. Um, but we're looking for versatility. We don't want to be changing parts out, moving things around. Like, in other words, if we're going to go cut an I-beam, I don't want to have to change the tooling locations if I'm going to switch over to something else, you know? So I'm very conscientious about that. So anyway, that's our plan. Now, that means that we have three axes up and down on the tooling plate, in and out, and obviously up and down the machine. That's three, right? Fourth axis is to rotary. Fifth and sixth axis would be tilt this way and tilt that away. So that is six servos right there. Um, and that's what we had the machine designed. All those control boxes I showed you back there, they were designed to handle up to six. And then we ran into Fabtech and I started thinking, <clears throat> um, if we emulate beamline cutting, what we do is it's a game changer because we open up the market because we're guessing that that attachment, now it's not going to be a cheap attachment. Don't, don't get me wrong. It, it's, it's probably going to punch in around thirty to $40,000. It's a lot of money. Um, so by the time you add this machine to it, let's just say currently the price of this machine, it's still selling at the 79.9 price uh, list for 89.9. Now that may be going up later, but no hurry, no hurry. Um, so it's 80 grand now. So you look at 120 grand. <laughs> What's better, 800 grand or 120 grand? Now um, it's an expensive attachment because there's a lot involved with. It. There's there's more servo motors. There's a whole lot going on. But also the software is um, pretty doggone tricky. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, that's what we're going to do to emulate a, emu emulate a beamline machine. And that's why we stopped production on the back back there, because to do that, we had to substantially increase the size of the control boxes in the machine. For instance, the cable carrier right here, we had to go to a larger cable carrier in order to handle all the extra wires and everything that we're going to be using to do that. Now, when we did that, we also thought, let's go ahead and make it extra big in case somebody later on down the road wants to run like a 300 amp um, plasma system or something like that with a big two inch body and a bigger hose, a uh, bigger um, cord. So we went ahead and we've increased the size of this, which meant everything that we built before, all of this, all of the plates, all of the control boxes, everything, even the, all the trays, all of it had to be scrapped. Now, you got to figure, we had already built enough of those for eight machines, and we just had to throw it all away. All of the back planes, all the electrical schematics, everything in the garbage. So I don't know what it cost us. If I had to guess uh, labor time over the last four weeks, I'm going to say we got 30,000, you know, something like that, probably a little bit more into it. Because we were ready to go in production in November. We were building machines and then everything stopped. Now, I talked to most people who have XR12s in order, told them what, I, what I'm doing. And, and they're basically their line of thought was, well, if you're crazy enough to do this, then I'm going to wait the extra four weeks or whatever it takes you to, to pull this off because that would be amazing. And imagine just being able to cut C-channel, like let's say you're in the stair industry, right? Just to go ahead and load it in the machine, you know, clamp it down and, and go. And then still have the marking system where you can mark where you're going to weld everything. Easy peasy. That's why I'm telling you, this is the game changer. So we made the decision to go ahead and make the changes now because this is something that cannot be retrofitted in the field. It has to be done at the factory because of the extra large um, um, boxes and everything. We Heck, we had to increase the size of these the, everything changed. I mean, it was a, about the only thing that didn't change was the machine itself. It was fine, but everything else had to get, had to be changed. So um, I've explained to you why the, the beam cut functionality. Now, let me tell you some of the things I'm doing. I'm going to walk back here behind the machine again. This is our tried and true marker system. It's a dual marker system, has markers and engravers. I'm currently finishing up designing a new model. And the new model is about half the size of this thing. It's taller, but it's much, much um, smaller in footprint. And it's a little bit different design. I've got it to made, made to where you could put almost any tool you want into it. And I've also got one of the toolbars. In, in other words, on this one here, I should have said this. On this one here, it's two marking systems. You got one on each side. I'm trying to move it, but it's under here. Under here. So you got two of them in one unit. 
the new design is independent units. So somebody in the future could go ahead and load up um, multiple units. So say, for instance, you were um, doing artwork and you had four different colors of markers and you wanted to, I don't know, I'm just making stuff up, right? You can mount individual units into the machine because as I mentioned in previous videos, our new control system is almost unlimited number of input outputs. Just keep adding them to the machine. It's all about real estate. How much room do you have to put this stuff in? So I'm about done with the redesign of the new, um, of the new marker system and I'm trying to shrink it down to give us more room to handle this torch. All right, now another thing we're gonna do, on a previous video, I was drilling 13 16 inch holes in the machine um, with, the, with the Hogan drill, everything ran fine, right? Um, then I started thinking about it more, I gotta quit this thinking crap. So I started thinking about it and I, and I thought, okay, maybe we wanna be able to have the ability to put in two drill heads. So I'm working on that idea right now, but to do that, if you go to two drill heads, you now have to put, now I'm gonna use this, just. Picture this as a drill head, right? So you've got one drill head here and one next to it, which means they have to be on independent slides up and down to clear each other. If you're running a single drill head like I did in the previous video, then you don't need any of that because the drill hangs down below this and if you're cutting pipe or something like that, you don't have to worry about interfering it because this whole torch will go up two inches and get out of the way. Everything's hunky-dory. However, if we're gonna go to the Z-axis tilt system with the drill head in it, then we need the option of being able to mo move that drill up or down before it starts drilling to basically clear all of the other tooling. That means that's another motor. That's another servo, another amplifier, another slide, the whole doggone bit. Now, we are gonna have the standard drill, which we told everybody's gonna be uh, $4,950. $4, that's, that's no problem. So if you're cutting pipe, everything is hunky-dory, you're, you're doing good. But later down the road, if you wanted to put two drill heads in it, then you would need that slide up or down. Now, another issue where that comes in, let's say you've got a piece of I-beam and you wanna drill some holes in the middle of the I-beam. Obviously, you gotta clear the flanges from the drill head itself, but let's just say you wanted to drill holes in the flange. Well, you can't drop the drill into the I-beam because you're gonna hit the bottom of the tooling plate on it, therefore, that's where the other slide will come in because that'll allow us to get down into the I-beam and start drilling. All right, bottom line is that's another motor right there. So we've got three motors on the Mac Daddy head, the one that's going to go tilt. And I'm going to explain to you there's going to be five different, well, four to five different tilt head mechanisms. I'll talk about that in a minute. Anyway, so that's what we're doing on the drilling solution. Now, what happened at Fabtech was we were talking to people. I mean, we were slammed the whole show, you know. Um, so... That, that meant I wasn't paying attention to the machine, and we were drilling holes, 13, 16 inches holes at Fabtech. Well, what happened is I didn't put enough oil on it, and um, the slug, and, and it came up, and we were only drilling one hole, so it wasn't a big deal. But when the drill came back up, the slug had not completely ejected out of the annular drill bit. It was still up in there a little bit, which would have caused major havoc if we'd have then gone over and started drilling a second hole. So the changes I'm making now to the drill assembly is we've added um, a switch to it to where when that whole thing ejects out, that switch will be triggered telling us that yes, the slug was ejected. And what happened is I didn't put enough oil on the bit while it was cutting. And the whole show, I was putting oil on it, everything was running fine. And then that one time I squirted a little bit on it to get it going, started talking to somebody, forgot about it, you know? So in order to solve that problem, we're doing, um, or to make sure it doesn't happen, we're doing three things. As I mentioned, we're adding a switch to it to verify the slug was ejected. We're also adding a pump to, to go into the reservoir that will come up and will spray coolant directly onto the drill bit as you're drilling. It doesn't have to be an annual drill, but it could be a quarter drill or whatever. Um, it will be putting it directly on it. Now, what happened um, was if you look at all of our videos, we're cutting with a Pico Solution. We love that company also, great product. Um, it's green, it's a green color. So we called and said, hey, can we 
spray lubricant like cutting oil, you know, will it mess up your coolant? And they go, it absolutely will. It'll destroy it. So, but good news is we have a new one out that has lubricity built into it and it's blue in color. So we thought, all right, let's get that. So they sent us some of that. So that solved our problem. So now we can put coolant at the drill and it has lubricity built in it. Now, another thing we added was to get the slug out of the drill, I had to, I just basically took a pair of needle nose and, and it came right out, you know, easier than pulling a tooth. So anyway, it came out. But what would have been nice was if I could have cycled the air cylinder up or down that is ejecting the slug and basically, you know, tap, 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 and just tapped it right on out of there. So we've gone ahead and on the electronics on this panel over here, and I'll bring the camera over here and show it to you, we've added a lot more capability on the machine to allow us to have that switch to where we can tap, 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 tap if we need to do that. Now, in our control system, we will be adding the feature to try to re eject the slug. So, say for instance, we're, we're drilling multiple holes and then somewhere, um, the slug doesn't get ejected, right? So when she comes up, we're going to have the control system. It'll now know the slug hasn't been ejected because the switch was never triggered. Then we're going to go through a tap, tap cycle ourselves, tap, tap, tap. And then if it still doesn't eject, then the machine's going to fault out and say, hey, you need to um, remove that slug. And in the software, we're going to be putting in the ability to restart after that error. That's pretty important. We don't want you to have to go through the code to find it. So you could tell that the entire drilling solution is pretty comprehensive. It's a relatively, um, uh, it's a good system, you know? Now, one other thing I may do on it, I'm thinking about going from a 32 millimeter air cylinder to a 40 just to give us a little bit more oomph, you know, to punch that slug out because it's pretty, it's pretty important. All right, so that's the drill. Now, the reason I was gonna put in two drills, by the way, is some customers wanna drill a hole and then they wanna come right back and tap the hole. So if we had two drills in it, we could do that. Boy, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, that's why we would need individual slides. Now, Hogan Drill Company, I like those guys too, um, they have a tap solution for their drill, which is fairly compact. I'll be able to get it into the machine, no problem. So that's why we wanted the ability to run two drill heads, which meant if we put a second drill head in, we need another servo motor. So now we're adding three more motors that we had anticipated earlier, one for the torch up and down, one for drill head number one, one for drill head number two. So that's three more amplifiers there. Um, and then of course, um, you know, you're gonna have the other amplifiers to, to move the torch. The bottom line is we're gonna need nine axes in this machine, nine servos. So we needed more room, which meant all the boxes had to get substantially larger. Anyway, um, I think I've talked about everything I'm gonna do right there. Um, and, and the cool thing about the XR12 and all of our new flat machines and everything is this tooling plate is replaceable. If I need to change a design, or let's just say a customer has got a, a specific application they need, well, it's no big deal for us to build a new tooling plate in order to accommodate their needs. Because remember, uh, I think I mentioned before, when I designed the XR12, it was, a, it was really, we were building a platform. It wasn't designed to build, be just a plasma cutter. I mean, we're gonna, you put a high speed spindle on this thing, which by the way, bolts right on, no big deal. Um, you're gonna be seeing that here, hopefully in a little while. I've been trying to get to it now for a couple months. And basically I wanna go carve a big wood statue. Um, so this machine is a true CNC rotary machine. So um, the bottom line is incredibly versatile. Now while I'm tapping on this aluminum plate, for you guys out there, some of the um, people may have wondered, we got a lot of tapped holes in it. These are not, these are all helicoiled with steel helicoils. Once again, it's all about reliability and quality. And I don't want you threading stuff in and out of an aluminum plate. For sure, it's gonna strip. So we go to the trouble. And I think there's 48 uh, 10 millimeter tapped holes that we helicoil every single one of them. It's all about building a good machine, guys. All right, let me do this. <clears throat> let me um, grab the camera and I'm gonna walk around and show you the control boxes and everything. And then we'll talk about the new ring system that we've got over there to a little bit easier to handle 
a large material. All right, let me go ahead and grab that camera. Let's start over here with the new control box that is mounted on the gantry itself. Before, we had the three amps and we allowed ourselves room for two more amplifiers and that would have handled the complete tilt head solution. However, we've gone ahead and we've added room now for four more amplifiers. So up here, we can actually mount nine amplifiers on the head itself. Now we only need eight for all of our proposed changes. Now if you notice, We've gone to much larger wire, um, what are they called, wire channels or whatever. Um, and the idea being is we have to have the room now to add all of this future functionality, which almost all of it's coming out here in um, 2023, hopefully in the first half of 2023. Um, if you notice, we've got a lot of DIN rail right there to where we could add a lot of relays or whatever we need to be putting in it to make sure that we're kind of future-proofing it. And you want to see something interesting? Um, this is the back plane right here. And previously, they were made out of aluminum. Well, when my son decided that we were going to go ahead and, um, you know, redesign all this, he said, let's go ahead and design it to UL508 specs. So he um, researched all that, bought all the papers from the government that you need to know what the laws were and all. And it turns out that you can't use an aluminum back plane. You've got to use steel. So we even had to change that, if you could believe it. Now, coming over here on the side, we've added panels. We've, add, we've got an e-stop up here. Um, but we've also added other panels to it. These are the automatic stabilizer controls for the stabilizer you've seen in previous video. But we've gone ahead and added more switches right here so that we could add the functionality I was telling you about, you know, tap, 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 to get that slug out of the machine. Now, we could also add other, we got an open hole here because that's where our switch is going to be going. So we've added that. Now, another feature that my son has already gone ahead and added to the machine was the relays and everything to where we can have some kind of uh, automatic stop system. So we're going to be working on that. And the idea being is we put a guard around, let me back up, a guard around here so that as this whole gantry is moving up and down the machine, up and down, if it hits you, it will trigger that stop and stop the gantry from moving. Now at the rear of the machine, um, about the only thing you're going to be able to do is run guardrails because since the head is going in and out with the, with the cable chain, I'm not sure how you would do that. You would have to have a guard way back there. It would just be cumbersome and not very practical. So anyway, that is the head right there. We've even made all that sheet metal all there, got changed up there to allow for larger torches, stuff like that. And like I said, I'm just trying to give you an overview of what we've been doing. Uh, we've been working really, really hard for the last six weeks. And um, let's come over here. And I'll show you something that was kind of interesting. Now we've been building rotaries now for what, over two and a half years? And um, this is our system, it's all ball bearing, everything works great. And we had a customer, um, I can't remember where he was at, and basically, the reed switch, we use a non-contact, you can see it right here, this blade will go through the reed switch right there. So it's a non-contact system, um, very reliable. And for some reason, his wasn't triggering. So I ended up changing the design slightly, went to aluminum, moved the reed switch to the right, solved the problem. I mean, can you believe that? Two and a half years, never had a problem, and then we run into it. But we take everything serious. I mean, if he's got a problem, then it's our problem. So we went ahead and redesigned that. So if you've got a machine, one of our rotaries, and you ever have that problem, um, and like I said, we've only seen it one time, just give us a call and obviously we'll send you the free parts over to convert it over free of charge. Anyway, um, let me walk around slowly right here. All right, so I've already told you I'm changing, you know, all of that there, what's changing. Um, let's walk over here. This obviously got much larger, the cable carrier, but we also went to a much, uh, a, a little bit more different system. Now there's a giant cover that goes on here. I've got all the covers off the machine, big cover goes on there. Um, you can see where we've moved the solenoid system here because we know that we're gonna be adding more and more air solenoids to the machine in order to handle certain functions. So we wanted more room. So we've moved some of the stuff out of the control box 
yeah, I'm sorry, my hand was messed with the focus, out of the control box, out here, and it's all covered all. So we've done all that right there. Now, let's walk over here, and this is what really changed. I'm gonna back up a little bit here. And this is the new control box. And it is 40, I think it's 44 or 46 inches long. And you can see how we've done it. It's um, extremely large wire, um, wire channels and everything like that. And that's all about the future functionality of the machine. That's our new control system right there running. Um, and we could expand more over to the right if we need. We could also go to the left um, we like to use Eaton components. If you notice, if I get in there here, you got Lovato right there. Um, we like to use quality components. We're, we're not a big fan of some of the Chinese stuff. Um, that's the big amp right there that's controlling the large motor. Anyway, that's the new control box. And believe it or not, that box weighs 200 pounds. Um, everything just got massive with the machine. All right, let me walk over and I will show you the, well, let's walk over here. This is a very informal video, guys. That's, that's just what I do. Anyway, this is our new ring assembly. Now, we haven't powder coated any of this or anything like that. And it's all dowel pinned. And the idea is that you take, this is the top. This is the top one with the T. Basically, you're gonna be able to, let me back up a little bit, put that onto the rollers, load your tubing into it, and then bolt on the top. It's very, very clean, very, very quick system, and it ends up looking like this right here. And um, it worked just absolutely beautiful. Now that stand there, I mentioned earlier that we're gonna probably build and sell them. And the idea being is, let's say you did wanna cut a pipe in this machine, and let me back up so you can see a little bit. I'm trying not to shake the camera, guys, but you know how I am. I'm, I don't, I'm not ultra good at making videos. I just start talking. But anyway, um, let's just say you did want to handle a large piece of pipe and the motor was able to handle it from an inertia point of view. Then you could use a stand like this to extend the workpiece off the end of the machine. Now, speaking of that, let's walk over here and I'll tell you of something else about the servo motors that we really, really like. And the idea is we use Yaskawa motors for a reason. Um, one of the reasons is they're the world's best motors or one of the world's best motors. There's a lot of really great companies making motors out there, but Yaskawa is definitely mentioned as one of the world's best. Well, with these motors, we can change the tune of the motor at the, at the machine. So, so say for instance, um, we're gonna be adding a feature to the machine so that when you are rotating big heavy material, we're gonna to wanna to retune the servo to handle that kind of inertia. So we'll have multiple tunes available. So if you were spinning very small tubing, let's just say three quarter inch or something like that, then that would really, you would, a better cut could be produced if the motor was tuned for that inertia deal. So we're going to be doing that here in the future to where we could actually adjust the motor on the fly. These are really, really good motors. Um, well, anyway, um, I think I've covered everything. Um, let me see. Have I covered everything? No, I haven't. Let me go ahead and put the camera back on the stand. I'm, I'm sorry. I know it's shaking. Let me go ahead and put it on the stand so it's a little bit stabler. Is that a word, stabler? It's more stable, <laughs> okay. Let's go ahead and talk about our tilt head plans for the XR12 and XR6. There's gonna be four different versions of the tilt head, all varying, of course, in complexity and price. The first one is just gonna be a manual tilt head. So it's basically a machined uh, aluminum part that you can adjust the head which way you wanna go and you do it manually. Um, we're just gonna give that away for free. Anybody who's already got the XR6, um, and we'll, we'll be getting that for, we'll just send it to you, right? So that's no problem. The second one will be a single axis is tilt that is going to tilt this way along the axis and that's for people like in the gas and oil industry that are beveling pipe and by the way that's just about the only people asking me for tilt head right there very very few other applications so we're going to go ahead and do that because that'll be a relatively inexpensive system you're probably looking at around seven thousand dollars something like that now our software currently cannot handle 
beveling cuts, 3D cuts. However, that's what Camelot version 2 is going to do. Um, I'll be talking about software at the very end of this video when we're actually, you can see this thing moving. Um, so we're going to do that. Now in the meantime, talking to a lot of these gas and oil guys, all they really want is to bevel a pipe, cut a pipe. So we're going to go ahead and, and add wizards to the machine. And one of the wizards we're going to add is the functionality to where you pop up a dialog box, you'll input some data. For instance, I'm cutting 12 inch pipe. I want a 20 degree bevel on this end, 30 on this end. I need the whole thing 14 feet long, go, you know? Now that eliminates the need to have to go back to a CAM program, which saves you time. Plus people who are on the shop floor who may not understand the CAM program, they can understand that. So that's going to be something we're going to be banging out. Now that should all be done by the end of February. I'm actually going to be working hard on it in January. I'm trying to get it done in January, but you know how things are. So my official timeline is the end of uh, February because I've already bet a guy. I told him I'd give him $200 cash if I can't pull it off. And if I do, he owes me a Diet Coke, you know? So anyway, that's easy peasy. I'll have that done, no problem. Now that wizard will also affect people who have RC6s um, because a lot of them, people bought the RC already had a tilt head. They'll be able to use that right out of the box also. So that's the second. The third tilt head is one that goes in and out and rotates this way. Um, that system is going to punch in somewhere around $15,000 is what we're guesstimating. And um, it's really designed for if you're working with pipe, tubing, things like that, and you're beveling. Now, you could do it with other things. If you're spinning structural, it'll work there too. And then, of course, the uh, now that one I would like to have out in the second quarter of 2023. Um, the third one, the fourth one is the Mac Daddy. That's the one that's going to go up and down, in and out. That's for the beamline implementation. And hopefully we'll be beta testing that by the end of the second quarter also. Um, and it will be released in 2023 as soon as we can. Um, I don't know how long that'll take. But anyway, that's our plans on adding tilt head to the machine. So figure basic tilt head functionality should be working pretty good in January. Now, Hypertherm does make um, Rotary Cutter Pro software that does um, complete bevel cutting and everything. Now, I believe it only handles round and square or rectangular tubing. I, I, I'm pretty sure that's all it handles. Um, I've never heard of it handling structural or anything like that. Now, that's an expensive piece of software. Last I heard, I think it was $11,000. However, I mean, if you're in a need, they have gone ahead and um, graciously sent me a copy of the software so we can work with them on the post. And we will have the XR12-6 and RC6 hopefully working with that particular software here in the next month or so, you know? Um, it is an expensive solution, but sometimes any port in a storm, right? If you need it. All right, so anyway, that's our plans for Tilt Head. Let's go ahead and um, let's run it right now. Let's go ahead and fire this thing up for a minute. Now we're not gonna cut, but let's just go ahead and you can watch the machine move. Okay, I've gone ahead and loaded up the program. And now I've increased the speeds up to 200%. That's amazing, isn't it? That is a hunk of pipe right there. And this is a very simple cut. It's just basically, it's just something so that you can see the machine operating. Now while it's doing this, let me go ahead and give you my closing remarks. Um, for 2023, I was supposed to get back in town and design a 24 inch cutter. We got a, a couple people that are looking for that, two or three or four, something like that. Um, I'm not gonna be able to do that. I'm sorry guys, um, because what we've decided to do is just spend the entire year of 2023 making sure that all of our ducks are in a row um, as far as support for our existing customers. So for instance, I'm gonna be working with our tech guys and we're gonna be doing a lot of videos. I mean, as many videos as we can, answering every possible question that we think somebody could ask. So in other words, if you call support and say, hey, I got a problem, um, you know, that would be a good time to do a video and then we're gonna update our support page to where it's extremely easy to find this information that you need in order to solve your problems. So that for instance, if you're working on a Sunday morning, 
and you got a problem, well, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to answer the phone. So we, that's what we're going to be doing in 2023. We lost um, Fred. He was one of our tech guys. Some of you may know him. Very, very nice guy. Unfortunately, he had a brain tumor, a little over, uh, a, I'm sorry, a stroke, a little over a, uh, a, a month or so ago, a month and a half ago, and he had surgery and all. So he will be coming back. We're not sure when. And we lost another tech guy during COVID. And um, he didn't die or nothing. We, he just, he got married. Anyway, um, that's the same thing, I guess, right? <laughs> so anyway, um, what, so we've got a, uh, Cody back there is the new guy. Everybody loves Cody. He's always smiling. And we're trying to reduce the workload on him because we've been trying to hire a tech guy now for somewhere around two months. And um, once again, same problem. Everybody knows the problem. You, it's hard to find people, you know, so we're having that issue. So that's what I'm going to be working on 2023, an incredible number of tutorials, how to do things, how to solve problems. And we're just going to concentrate on our existing machines. For instance, the XR12, the XR6, um, putting, uh, can I get a drill head onto the flatbed tables, um, things like that. Now, is the guys who wanted me to build the big machines, I think I'm still going to solve your problem because if I recall, all you guys were telling me you just want to basically rotate I-beam. Um, you don't want to buy a beam line machine. Well, if I can get the functionality into this one that will do it, it's going to be a lot cheaper than a big machine. So anyway, our goal for 2023 is to have incredible support page to where you can almost find any information you need without having to call us. Um, a lot of tutorial videos, things like that, and of course, work on all these attachments. Anyway, I think that's all I got for you. Let me um, zoom this thing out a little bit so I could properly say goodbye. All righty. Here I am again. Anyway, um, we are extremely proud of the XR12, XR6. We, we think we've done a good job. I, I hope you agree. If you've got any questions, give us a call. I will be starting to blast out videos here in about a week. I'm just going to finish up a couple little design things I got to do, and then, man, I am all in. Um, but in the meantime, I really want to thank everybody for their support, and Happy New Year's. Goodbye.